Anyways, I want to welcome everybody for joining today. Today is a external arrow refresher. It, it is sort of the, we'll say a capstone of a few different webinars we've given over the past year or so. And really to loop back around and let everyone know what I consider um, what probably are best practices at this point. And this presentation itself was actually mostly stolen by Autodesk University or AU talk this past December. For those who don't know, Autodesk holds a, a large event in Vegas every year right after Thanksgiving. And um, people from Autodesk and customers will come in and do uh, various training and talks and so forth. So this is actually a very small subset of what was my about 90 minutes worth of talking. So. I encourage you, if you've got time, to read through the presentation that I have up on the au.autodesk.com website. Or um, I also wrote a, a nice document that goes along that with all my notes and, and thoughts. So this is how I consider sort of the highlights. Um, but I did skip a lot that was in a lot more detail. The slide deck will be available, as always, at autodesk.box.com. This one will be at CFD 22. And as you're going along, Todd is available in the background to answer any questions. Just open up the side panel on the right, and he will do his best to answer your questions and bring them to my attention if I can answer them live. Um, for those who have been around a while with Autodesk, you know that we seem to have a, a release that comes out somewhere around now. Um, so our next webinar will be talking about CFD 2017 and, and, and what's new. So we'll have Heath Houghton come in to the presentation just like last year. And um, it's a great time for you to join and ask our product manager, um, you know, what's new, what's going on, what's the vision, things like that. Some recent knowledge that I thought was interesting. Um, remember, these articles are created by us in tech support and posted at knowledge.autos.com. And if you're just sort of curious about what are some recent articles, you can go into the forums and there's a post there that our community folk um, will post anything new that we've written and made public. If you wanna know what the top articles are, then you can go to this link that will take you to the CFD landing site. Um, I think the top one I have answered multiple times here at Autodesk and under Blue Ridge back in the day in terms of uh, what time step really means for mass particle traces. So that's a good one to take in. For those who don't know, um, our current releases for the various versions are listed below. Uh, CFD 2016 Service Pack 2 has been out for a while now and I encourage you to be up to date. So today I pulled out three minutes main points I want to talk about. One is SimStudio versus surface wrapping and how that relates to external arrow models and complex geometry. And then I'm going to go into three modes or um, strategies, depending on how you want to call it, to consider for external arrow. And then I'm going to go into and share um, how to extract steady state and transient wall forces and how to be efficient with those and, and leverage a tool I created that you can download and use. This can be used for multiple things um, when it comes to wall forces, not just for you know external arrow. So let's say you have this car. This is actually a car drawn in alias. It's very complex. You can see the, the seat details and this picture in the lower right hand corner is actually some surface seams that go around the window panel. Uh, if you wanted to model this in CFD, you're probably going to um, bang your head against the wall. You're, you're going to not be very happy that your designer gave you this to give you, uh, you know, to do a study on. Um, if you have designers ever give you models of any sorts of details that require a lot of cleanup like this one does, I would push back on them and be like, no, no, no. You know, I need something a little bit closer to uh, simulation ready. So in this case, this is a, a model that we drew inside of Autodesk and we pushed back and spent some time in Alias to clean up a lot of the 
um, unneeded details like the steering wheel and seats and a lot of the wheel detail that we just didn't need. A lot easier to do it in the native tool. And um, once that's done, you, you might come back with a nice solid geometry, but you know, the, the, your designer may not exactly know um, what you might need. So in this case, what I had in the end was tons and tons of seams going around the model that if I were to try to model this in CFD, I, I could, uh, but the mesh inside of these little areas that would be needed to cleanly model this would just be unreasonable. The mesh would just be um, enormous. So in this case, I leveraged some studio tools to go in and delete all these seams, really clean up a lot of the details, and there's even some surfaces in here that um, are poorly defined, and eventually get down to this model that, um, if you remember from the earlier picture, and I have recordings in this from my AU talk of, of how to clean up this geometry. I don't want to go into that for this webinar, but now you can see how all these seams are removed. You look at this rear taillight, much cleaner surfacing going around where the taillight would be and around all the edges that came in. And if we start looking at the door paneling, this is all very smooth. And, and this model you can then bring into CFD and then start modeling and simulate. That in itself probably took me a few days. So if you were to try, depending on what your um, needs are at work, um, maybe you have a few days that you can really dedicate to making a, a very robust set of geometry to leverage all the tools inside of CFD to model. Um, so that would be a, you know, a full deep dive into geometry cleanup and prep and bring into simulation CFD or any real CFD tool of that matter. But maybe you don't have that time or maybe your needs are really just visualization. You just want to see how the flow might be going around this car for, uh, for marketing needs or just to do some quick what if studies and you just want to keep everything very, very consistent in how you set things up. That's where you might want to leverage uh, the surface wrapping tool. Surface wrapping now, which is this model itself is actually run from that um, initial Sim Studio model I showed you with all the seams, all the details and what you actually get once you put it through surface wrapping, depending on how much resolution you allow the surface wrapping technique to capture, but in this case I made it very low just as a proof of concept to see how everything is smoothed right over and that's, that's why it's called wrapping. It's basically taking uh, plastic wrap and laying it over the geometry and it will just sort of skip over any valleys that it might have. Um, now the downside is that you do lose some fidelity of the model, but I was able to get this running within, you know, easily within an hour um, versus, you know, a few days of active time. Most of that hour inside of the surface wrapping is just waiting for the wrapping algorithm to, to complete and then bring that inside of uh, CFD. So, you know, that's a quick Sim Studio tools and surface wrapping. But in the end, what do you really want to know? Is like, when should I, when should I use the valuable time that I have to go in Sim Studio tools, clean up my geometry, and bring it into simulation CFD? And when should I use surface wrapping? And the biggest thing is, if you have the time, you, know, you might want to dedicate it to getting a robust model that's going to allow you to use all of the meshing tools inside of uh, Auto CFD like adaptation and refinement regions and uh, automatic controls and, and things like that. The surface wrapping right now really is more of a, um, a little bit of a black box, I'll say, in the sense you do have some uh, tuning parameters to add in more resolution, to capture more geometry. You can put in some regions to define more mesh, like in the wake behind this car, for instance. But you don't have the controls like you would have in the automatic um, meshing tools inside of CFD. If you want to get a very accurate model, if I was, uh, my goal was to do lift and drag in this car or maybe look at some 
um, complex configurations, maybe a different uh, positions of side wind, for instance. And then, yeah, some studio would be my, my go-to. If I need results tomorrow and I'm being pushed to get something, or I need just rough measurements, so the geometry is just way too complex, you don't have the skills to, to actually simplify it, then surface wrapping is going to be what you're going to be able to use. Um, this will give you system level forces so you can get the wall forces along the entire car body uh, versus some studio to CFD approach you can now come in and do selective surfaces of maybe just the side window um, or just the hood of the car or the the, um, the front windshield things like that so those that would be the mindset I would go through in trying to determine where I'd want to go and what tools to use any questions coming in, Todd? Not yet, but yeah, I, I would say um, you know just to kind of add to what you said is the the more robust robust method right now is going to be where you have to put in the more work. You know, Sim Studio cleaning up your geometry that's going to give you a little bit more that you can do, and it's going to cost you the time and effort for it. Exactly. Yeah, and we've talked about surface wrapping earlier this year with the webinars. We've given demos. There's um, other uh, recordings online within YouTube and simhub.autodesk.com that talk about uh, some of the workflows there. So that's why I didn't go into really a demo of that. Right. So the next slide is uh, sort of three categories or uh, modes to think about when you're modeling external arrow. Uh, there's attached flow, there's complex turbulence, and then there's more of the special case or um, academic case of more of you, know, you want to look at frequency response or a stroll hole number of some sort of geometry. And I laid out a approach back for CFD 2015 with various flags that were needed to solve NAC airfoils. A lot of those now are not necessary inside of 2016. There are actual turbulence models that leverage those settings. So if you're using 2016, follow these um, um, blocks, depending on what's going on. So I think what is necessary is attached flow to me means that you have very streamlined bodies. You don't have a lot of wake. Everything stays attached. You know, an airfoil that is below um, a stall within you know, different angles of tack, you know, that, that's considered mostly attached flow. Uh, once you get beyond um, stall, then, you know, that's transitioning from attached flow to more of a complex wake structure or turbulent structures that really is now approaching more of a transient response of these uh, wake structures um, detaching and, and, and flowing downstream behind some sort of body. If you were to do like an Ahmed body, if you're familiar with that model for a car, for instance, you know, that that is a sort of in between attached flow and complex turbulent structures. So I would probably stick to the complex turbulent structures, um, especially at higher speeds. Um, now a few things to really look at here is the uh, you know, there, there's some some play, I guess, or, or you know, what what are your real needs here? Like, if you look at the attached flow, I make some comments here about 10, 15, 30 layers of mesh enhancement. You know, th these are some, you know, depending on what you're looking at and how sensitive the the lift and drag or what you're looking at is in terms of the separation point is really going to drive how much wall refinement you're going to need. Um, the last bit at the bottom in terms of convergence, um, there's more detail in this at, in my AU talk, but really this is talking or getting to the point of when you're running to convergence, which you should always try to do when you're looking for lift and drag, um, if you just change your convergence tolerance from default to tight, that almost is always going to auto-converge too early. It's just not tight enough. So what you can do is there's a checkbox, and I can show this if people want to see this, next to this to do edit controls. 
And two orders of magnitude is really just adding another two zeros to those four boxes within the convergence window. And that, that really gets to a much tighter study um, or result. The, um, so I'll, I'll move on. And really, I'm going to go into a quick example for the Strohholm number. Um, the attached flow really is what I did earlier last year for NAC airfoil. So I'm not going to go into that right now. So the classic example for studying um, frequency spots behind a body is really just flow over a cylinder. So in this model here, which is one you could easily set up yourself, is a, a cylinder. It's one inch, 1.5 inches in diameter. I made the edge mesh along that 0.00 meters, that surface mesh everywhere else 0.004. And this is just a oil um, material. Uh, I use one of our um, default ones with an Autodesk. And the flow is coming in 30 feet per second. I'm using my or my uh, store hole number approach from before. And in this case, I ended up using 30 layers of mesh. Uh, this ended up resulting in a Y plus of about 0.2, which is uh, my goal for these models. And in this case, what you'll see downstream is that I started with 100 time steps as a starting point and then did some sensitivity studies, and we'll, we'll show you what that did. Uh, with these models, you want to have intelligent solution control turned off, and that actually is to help do the frequency response study, because downstream you'd want to do an FFT, potentially off of the um, uh, wall force uh, results, or maybe even off of the um, velocity components that also sort of capture the wake structure. You could go in and do a peak to peak study, but you know that takes some time. And the tools that I'll be showing later can leverage the frequency response of some of these results to make it a lot easier to pull out results. But anyways, expect the results. I'm going to look at a subcritical flow at a stroll hole number expected of about 0.19, which means that my frequency this is about 56 hertz and looking for a drag of about 1,600 newtons. With this study, I really was focused on frequency. Um, I actually got pretty lucky. The first mesh I applied to this, from my experience, worked out very well. Um, I didn't really troubleshoot this or try to get a more accurate drag result. I really wanted to show you know, what happened if I you know, went with this approach with the surface and edge mesh, and you know, how close was my drag results and my frequency response to that you know, too much real troubleshooting. Um, in this case, if you look at the stroll hole number through a large range of rental numbers flow, you, there's actually a very um, large range of about 0.1 over even 0.4 for that stroll hole number. So what I get in terms of results, I ran this out for quite a long time um, to make sure it was fully converged, and I ended up with a stroll hole number of 0.18, and a frequency of about 43 hertz. That's about 6% error, so not too bad without any tuning. And my drag force results on that, what would be a cylinder in 2D, was about 1,400 newtons. Uh, so I was actually very happy with those results. Uh, now, the question is, well, okay, you use this uh, stroll hole number setup, use those best guidelines, you know, what if I did my attached flow setup? How, how poor would the results be at that point? So now this is using that Helsian turbulence model. Um, I talk about turbulence a lot more in my AU talk. And um, yeah, frequency is still not that bad. It went higher, about 14%. And that's not a bad range to be in terms of percent error with these types of simulations. And, and the drag force actually improved. And that, that has to do more with um, uh, the Helsian model probably being more accurate than the SAS. The SAS model is much newer, and there's probably more tuning to that long term to get it to be more accurate. So overall, you know, still a reasonable area to be. You know, six percent for frequency for a for a model that's designed to capture wake structures versus a model that's probably much more accurate for lift and drag, and results in better numbers there. So overall, you know, I'm seeing what I probably would expect. Now for myself, I. I I never like one data point. I always preach when you're doing 
external arrow to not compare one point. It doesn't always tell you a whole lot. So when I first ran this model, this is a subcritical regime, I got this blue star right here. And um, yeah, I, I was pretty happy. And then I took the step back and ran it at uh, four other Reynolds numbers to see what would happen. All of a sudden, uh, I was not as happy with my result. And um, capture the overall trend, which is what we always talk about at Autodesk is uh, you know keep your your uh, approach consistent and you'll see the overall trend of what you're looking at and we do see that going from laminar to wherever else but um, overall you know for me I, I wanted to be much closer just to make myself more comfortable with my approach so all I did was change the time step for this model from you know, I, I knew what my frequency was going to be, so I changed it from 100 um, points per frequency to 1,000, so an order of magnitude larger, and that moved the, sorry, the blue stars all the way up to the red star. So now I'm really right on target, and if you watch the NAC airfoil talk I gave before, you know, these aren't, you know, these models can capture laminar flow but they're really turbulent models. They, they are not a laminar to turbulent um, 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 turbulence model. So they can solve down there, but it's going to have a little bit more air. So you can see at the more turbulent values, it's basically right on the trend and um, not as quite accurate down at the lower Reynolds. So that's actually expected. Um, you know, if you were to look in academic papers, a laminar to turbulent model is really sort of, you know, ongoing study and um, really not really, not really for academic or uh, industry um, use right now, in my, in my opinion, from what I've been told. Any hey, questions, Roy. Todd? Uh, you did get a couple pop in. Um, awesome. How long did that take to run when you uh, <laughs> when you <cranked laughs> the iterations? <laughs> yeah, so it's it's a very good question. Um, this is actually that study I, I meant to bring that in earlier, so you, you can see you know how clean that wake structure is. And I went a lot longer than needed. So if I were to look at my um, Oh, maybe I shouldn't do that while animation is going. Okay, there we go. Actually, it worked. Um, so you can see all the saved intervals that I did, and um, I actually ran this back last October when I was preparing for a U. Let's see here. So the analysis was, um, let's say, 20,000 seconds. So Todd, what does that end up being in terms of uh, hours there for you? I don't know. Let me bring up a calculator real quick. Like twenty thousand divided by three It took you about five and a half hours to run time for a two yeah, D analysis. <laughs> yeah, for two D analysis. And again, I ran time. this. Yeah. So I ran this way longer than needed if you look at a convergence plot. I could probably run this. I probably could have stopped it back here. Yeah. Okay. Or no, maybe not there, maybe here. So you can see you know, the turbulence here, which is part of what's defining the uh, drag value, is really um, still not fully converged. Um, if you were to look at these peak-to-peak, -peak, I should use a different color, peak-to-peak -peak values that really would be the stroll hole number that I'm looking at, um, I actually did look back earlier, and um, you know that actually is pretty consistent. It, you know that really builds in pretty quickly, uh, yeah, especially after you get through this. Look like they this might transition. be there even before that transition. Yeah, um, that, that looks pretty pretty close. Yeah. So yeah. So in other words, five and a half hours was overkill, and that's just. I like to do that with external error models. You know, I, 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 have, I have the time I can do that in the cloud, so why not do it? Any other right. questions? Uh, did you set, I'll 
also how many iterations was set at each time step. How many inner iterations, maybe? I'm not sure if I get that question. One. The only time you really need inner iterations, from my experience at this point, is if you have um, variable material properties with a transient study and that you have very dramatic changes in the state of your fluid, like you're compressing gas and you're right. watching that density increase. Um, sometimes there's some other use cases, but I, I think that sort of captures the, uh, the essence of when that's needed. Yeah, usually, I don't know, I guess I've heard uh, conversation with development stating with free surface to raise it, but... Oh, yeah, I with haven't free surface... That. No, free surface, you want to have at least three to five, somewhere in there. Um, yeah. When you go through the workflow to set it up, it will actually default to three on you. Yeah. If you're not paying attention. Okay. A couple of those defaults are bugging me right now, by the way, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Seemingly, depending on what you click before you turn on free surface, it changes what the default... Uh, time step size is for it, FYI. But anyway, that's that's regardless anyway. of what we're talking about. Anyway, yeah, yeah. You know, going back to this model, since they're bringing up solve time, and and there's probably some thoughts of, wow, you really overmesh like that. And I would agree. I took a very simple approach to this of, um, you know, not trying too hard to add in a lot of refinement regions to the whole system. And really, I probably could have come in and just had a refinement region right about there um, and ran with that and this would have solved even quicker. So don't think that you need to have your your, whole, your entire domain this really fine mesh. 2D lets you uh, do a little overkill I guess. Yeah, throw the kitchen sink at it. Yep. Um, any other questions or is that uh, there is a question for commenting on your advection scheme. So any one of these advanced turbulence models for external aero, you're going to use advection scheme 5. Period. I think they, yeah, I think so. And I'm, I want to say that the software actually changes that for you now. If you use the Helston, you with Helston, yeah, yeah, yeah. When you use the um, Helston or the uh, Shmirnov Mentor, yes, th that will both those will require the advection scheme five. Um, the other ones don't, but in all reality, any of these SST K Omega models, they were developed with ADV five as their core um, numerical method, so. It's best to use what the developer used when developing it. Okay, they did go back to make sure that the models would work with ADV two, one, four. Um, I don't think they went to three. I hope not. But that was more just yeah. It, four years. <laughs> they're more. It was more for uh, functionality for special use cases where maybe you have to go back to use those. Like if you had a surface part and you needed. Um, very accurate pressure drops, and well, maybe you have to go to advection scheme one. You know those, those types of oddities. Uh, but then I would question the real need for that turbulence model. So it's more of a, um, you know, non-typical use case. Okay. Any other stuff? I'll keep moving forward. Uh, that's what we got for the moment. So let's let's roll. Sweet. Okay. Um, so when you're running these models, one of the tricks to running external arrow is knowing when it's converged. And a lot of times when you look at the convergence plot, things look converged, but maybe the wall force results aren't actually converged. So uh, Stepping back a few years ago, what I would do would be to literally watch the wall calculator, write down a value, and maybe 
a few hours later or the next day, if it's a really slow model, write down the value and be like, okay, how much did it change? It hasn't changed at all. Merge plot's not changing. Uh, pretty confident that um, that is probably done. Um, not a whole lot of fun, not very scientific, and uh, yeah, I didn't really enjoy that. So at one point, um, I then was like, well, I wonder if I could take screenshots. So I actually wrote a little tool to actually take a screenshot of the wall calculator results and then use some um, character recognition through Python, pull out the results, and pull that into a table. Yeah, that was stupid. I was wasting my time. But it was kind of fun. Uh, while I was going through that exercise, I talked to the developers, and eventually they uh, created an output file that would output the wall force results, leveraging a flag, um, for every iteration. Awesome. Now I can uh, post-process that and, and do a whole lot of things. So I wrote a, a, a tool that would leverage that file, pull all those wall forces into Excel, and then determine what, you know, then do coefficient and drag and lift off of uh, you know, typical directions, plot those out, as well as calculate FFTs to come out with any store hole or other sort of frequent response that I might want. Um, I would use this at the time when I first built it just to look at the uh, wall force results in an XY plot so that I can see if it's really um, plateaued or not and, and and let it go from there. And then I added in all the other details. So in the case of this model, that's what I would do. I just ran the model, used the uh, tool itself, which um, um, when you come into the add-ins, you, you can click on set flags to set up the model beforehand. You have to add in an inlet um, plane, so it captures some of the velocities and um, so forth. And then you can type in your um, projected areas for drag and lift, so you can get your coefficients. Um, and also give a general direction for what the lift direction will be. Drag is easy to figure out from the result. Royce, you want to show where you would go to get the uh, the wall force history tool? Because I've never realized it, but I, I don't think we ever really point out um, that you can go through the start menu and grab the apps. I don't know if yeah. I've ever done that in a webinar. So that, yeah, that's yeah, a fantastic. I can show that. Yeah. yeah. So this one, um, I actually have not put up into oh, the app exchange. Way. Okay. Yeah, so it's not downloadable. So uh, I shared this at AU. Um, if you happen to find that talk and look at it, you'll just saw the download link for that. Um, but I did put the installer within the box folder for this talk. So you can download it right there. Um, but in general, since Todd brought that up, if you were to go to um, apps.exchange.artist.com, And then go under simulation. No, I do not want to give input right now. Um, <laughs> really aggressive with that window. I see it all the time. Yeah. Uh, you'll see some it. other tools in here as well, as well as some post processing and um, other tools in there too. Most of the ones that I've written are under post processing, and, and there's some other ones too. Okay, so that's where you download some apps, you just sign in and let it go. Um, whoop. Oh, so, uh, breaking stuff. Yeah. I want to make sure I get the right link in there. Wow. My apologies when I post that. Uh, so that, that's really what I wanted to do and talk about. I, I can go into these models in more detail. I, I can give some demos in terms of... Uh, some surface wrapping or some studio. Uh, you know, the big part I really wanted to share was the flow of the cylinder and how, you know, how you can 
test get a better result just by changing the time step with these uh, wake structure models. You know, if you don't know what your frequency is, then you know what is a critical frequency to you for your design, and then maybe go a hundred time steps below that so you can potentially start capturing that uh, to start with. You know, that's where I would want to go. Otherwise, this was the uh, big thing I wanted to share in terms of, you know, where do you start? And this is where I would start. That's a reasonable starting point. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, definitely go for... Um, so one of the... One of the things that I've noticed in, in talking to a handful of people, you know, if you look up, uh, I want to say in the knowledge network, if you're looking how to choose a time step size, when you're looking for trying to capture like a wake structure or something like that, you know, we're saying that the whole domain grab maybe uh, be able to catch a particle 10 times from inlet to outlet. That's really nowhere near what you need to try and capture that frequency of the the shedding here. Um, mm -hmm. So I did see a comment I think from Muhammad um, about you know how I did all this plotting and so forth. I used our Python API linking that to Excel which would then post process this um, CSV file, which the solver writes out when you solve. So if I were to open this up in Notepad, what you would see is for every um, iteration while it's solving, the edge in this case, or surface in the model, so that's just the actual ID for that entity, and then the X, Y, and Z components of force in the units that you're solving in. Um, so that then goes for every single value. And if you had multiple edges and surfaces in the model, for every iteration, it would give you the output for that, for every single entity in the model. So in the tool that I wrote, because I don't like to repeat things at all, um, I leverage a group using a um, um, WFH for wall force history space uh, numerically increasing from wall force history space one, WFH space two, three, four, as many groups as I want to actually have, and they can overlap, they can be all the exact same, um, or maybe you have, want to study uh, cars in tandem and you have wall force history for the first car and wall force history in the second car. And once you have that, and you know you run with um, either steady state or transient tool working either, and before you run, you click in the set flags button in the add-ins. What that will do is make sure that this flag is turned on, residual boundary force flag is turned on, and um, make sure that you're using an induction scheme five um, for, for your models, and that's required. Once you do that, click in the post process button, and click on run. and let the Excel, and this will take probably, I think a minute, draw a lot of values. <clears throat> and the Excel API for uh, Python isn't super fast. So you get to watch it sort of just build the Excel file. And um, it will also generate all the plots for you automatically as well. So we'll just watch this as uh, questions may or may not come in. Um, so what's going on here? is you see every iteration, and then the third row there in Excel, that's actually giving you the average value of the last 200 points. Um, so it's considered a quasi, maybe steady state value uh, that you can at least start looking at. Um, Seem to work out pretty well, but of course, if your time step is so low and you happen to be in a, in a trough or peak, you know, obviously that's going to be bad. Um, and then it switches over to coefficients. So that is being post-processed in the background. And then it comes out, it does the FFT in Python, 
does a, I think a handing window, and it does some zero padding. So you know it's doing the signal pro um, numerical processing to get decent values there. So it's power spectrum. So we get our magnitude in the x and y for each of the different frequency buckets. Z, of course, is blank. And now we'll start seeing the plots getting generated, I think. There we go. So it does all the plot forming for you automatically. So as you can see, I had a lot of fun in Excel and learning how to program all that. Um, so now if we look over here on the right, I actually, um, so of course, in the first few hundred iterations, it's pretty noisy in terms of uh, impulse. So maybe you bring this down to 5,000. Sure, 2,000. There we go. And we can make this one 2,000 as well. And, you know, we can start seeing our Y forces, E forces, coefficient of drags, and, um, you know, within time iterations. Uh, if we move over to the right, Let's see here. You know, then this is where we see our lift, um, our lift result. Okay. So pretty cool tool. Um, hope people enjoy it. All right, yeah. Nobody's got any questions. I think we got them all. Okay, I can't even find my question panel right now. Uh, any questions on surface wrapping? Anyone actually use surface wrapping yet? Oh, man. I wish we had a poll for that. Because I'm curious. Yeah. Nobody's asked me anything with it. So let's do this. So I have a question here in the poll of, of have you seen this before? That question really means have you used surface wrapping before? So have you seen what I'm showing you in the screen, not actually the car, but surface wrapping? No? That was someone's really quick with that. Hey, we got someone, two, three. You guys are quick. We got 50% voted. 54%. Okay, so we actually do have 30. About 30% 30 of the people that actually voted have actually used it. Um, do you guys have any comments of what you thought about it, or were you successful with it? Uh, I'll close that now and share. Um, you can add into the uh, question panel and uh, uh, we got asked could we step through the workflow of using the surface wrapper if we have time we have a few minutes so we could do that yeah um, I don't know if we got a what would be I can pull it off real quick yeah, I was gonna say I don't know if you have a simple thing. I mean, I've I've done it on just like the valve or whatever. Mm -hmm. So what I have here. Uh, so this is right actually now we're still sharing the poll. Oh, let me close that for you. Okay, you're good. Cool. Thanks. So if you were to download um my presentation from AU, there are some built-in demos. You know, it's not good to do live demos when you're doing an industry talk. So this is actually a demo of going through that exact car and setting up surface wrapping. Uh, is that coming through pretty well? I don't usually like doing video demos like this through webinars, but. Uh, it seems to be going all right, yeah. Okay. 
So in terms of the surface wrapping and what we have in CFT 2016, it's sort of, it's a sort of an auxiliary application that runs alongside. And right now you import your, your we'll call it the nasty geometry in this car, and you start building the wind tunnel that you'd want it to leverage with surface wrapping. And then you have some parameters that you can then start tuning to get more or less uh, refinement. And you can even, in this case, add in a refinement region to line up with the back of the box, you know, just using little anchors like you would within um, the full CFT package. And in this case, I removed it, and now you generate the volume mesh. So really, it's a two-step process. Actually, it's more of a seven-step process of, um, of setting this up. But once you actually generate the mesh inside of uh, the surface wrapping tool, you can see here it does the boundary layers, it does the volume meshing. And it's very uniform mesh. Um, that's what I meant by you know, it doesn't leverage some of the auto sizing approaches that we have. Then what you actually do is you save out a NASTRAN deck file for the, the mesh itself from this tool. And then that will save out. And from here, you just do, from CFD, you go to new, you change that from CAD mesh files, and then read in that file itself. And really what you'll see once this reads in is exactly what I showed uh, with um, the model earlier in terms of um, you know, a pretty rough surface mesh. Uh, a silly thing to note, um, Make sure that you pay attention to the units and that your model doesn't get grown or shrunk while you're doing that. I don't know if that would be a problem or not with the surface wrapper tool, but I know I found something recently with a NASTRAN file where okay. but that was the way that someone was exporting it, I believe. Got it. Yeah, yep, yeah. Always check your knowledge units for people. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever we um, tell somebody to do something, hey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but surface wrapping really breaks down in about seven steps inside of 2016. Opening the geometry, to find the wind tunnel size, to find the surface wrap itself, any regions potentially, generate the volume mesh, export, and then read in the CFD and then go through model setup there in terms of boundary conditions. Um, some of that actually will improve for 2017, I expect, in terms of I don't think it's going to be an external app anymore. I think it will be built in and be a little bit more embedded in the tool. 2016 was kind of a stepping stone. Um, another little tidbit I'll give that you would get from um, my AU talk, since we've got time, is if you've ever wanted to know what the skin velocity of something looked like, um, or you wanted to basically model something and you want to see, if you were to put little strings on a grid on a car body, for instance, and you want to see what all the vectors, in essence, would point during a, sim during a simulation, you can actually use this option, the right wall dist flag set to one. What this will actually do is overwrite the Y plus result um, with a distance value. So you can actually then create an ISO surface, switch it to Y plus, so make it some small na nominal value like 0 0.001. That'll make an ISO surface just slightly offset, probably in the first layer of the boundary mesh and then turn on vectors, and now you can see the, um, the flow direction or flow profile just off the skin of whatever you're looking at. Okay. Kind of a cool little trick. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, we have about nine minutes to go, and I, I think I covered everything I wanted to cover. If there's no other... Yeah, questions out there? Had any questions in a few minutes, so we could give everybody back uh, a few minutes to their day. Great. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining. Uh, this will probably be our last external arrow 
um, turbulence model, uh, geometry cleanup type of webinar for a little while. Um, we'll, we're going to branch off into some other areas in the coming year. Yep. I think I've gotten a data center one coming up relatively soon. Awesome. Oh, flag settings. That's so. I'll show that for Rex, and then then we'll oh, then sure. we'll exit out. Uh, so flag settings. Um, thankfully, starting a few years ago is actually much more accessible. If you go to the setup window, you'll see a script editor, so you can do some internal quick Python scripting, or you can go here into the flags and um, maybe make this window a little bit bigger. And for every scenario, you can just define um, what would be measure or solver flags. And then if you wanted to explore um, all the flags that we have, then you can come into the default flag settings, and that can show you some flags you may not have known about. And I would encourage you not to play around too much in here. Um, <laughs> and uh, for the default flags, and there, there are some handy ones that are sort of graphic related. So if you want to go to user interface, these you can probably play around with. Um, one that I usually turn on for my installations is a transparent underscore widgets. And hit enter. So that was that first one that you could already see. Hit that checkbox and then set that to zero. Click on apply. And this will now apply to every time I load the software again. It's kind of an extended options window. So what this will do for me now is that if I have windows, these side panels that come up won't go transparent on me. I'm not a big fan of the transparent. Some people like it. I don't. Um, especially if yeah. I'm remoting into a machine, it can create some lag and, and just unnecessary graphics. Um, but you know, if you have a lot of windows open, it does let you see what's behind it. Yeah, I struggle. Sometimes I want it, sometimes I don't. Because uh, if I'm trying to capture that widget along with whatever I'm selecting for a screenshot or something like that. That's uh, the transparency will drive me nuts because it always goes transparent just as I'm trying to do something that I needed it shown. Right. And I used to get rid of the drop shadow in there too. Yeah. yeah. Same thing of using a flag. Yep. So with that, we don't have any more questions. So um, let you go have the rest of your day and look forward to uh, connecting with you guys in the future with for the web webinars. Yep. Thanks for coming, everybody. Have a good one.